Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Drama Club. On this week's episode, we've got stories of dramatic ass men. When in our hot topic, we talk about the clergyman who felt up Ariana Grande at Aretha Franklin's funeral. And then I tell you the story of super producer and super murderer, Phil Spector. And then Steph brings it home when she tells us the story of Louis C.K. and his <clears throat> um, impulse problems on this week's drama club. What up, fam? What up, fam? It's good, y'all. Feels good, right? Good, right? <laughs> yeah, I know it, dude. Yeah. And without further ado, we broadcast some live. You'll never believe how ratchet people get. Museum of Ratchet. I went I went out last night to the Museum of Ratchet. Close. I'll show you the picture right now. Where'd you go? The club in Koreatown. The club. I do it for the ratchets. Oh, sorry. It was that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. It was don't go there, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> what was it called? Arena. Oh, Arena. Yeah, it was it, there were ratchets and oh. there was a shit show and yeah did you meet someone there no yeah no hell no and all like it's the end of the summer i want to meet someone who's in town for like three weeks right maximum right i want to flirt furiously over text make out a little bit and like be done with it goodbye go our separate ways yeah uh, but and i thought like I could I could meet someone like that at the at club. club. Yeah, that's but, exactly the place, right? Like someone from Canada. Yeah. Remember that time those two Canadian guys hit on us at uh the standard rooftop? Oh <gasps> yes. And they wouldn't leave me and May alone. And then the waitress came around and was like, Do you want to buy them a drink? She yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. said it like that. Shout out to her. Yeah, that girl was fucking working. Yeah. Earning that tip, baby. <laughs> <laughs> she was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I want something. I want something like that. Yeah. But perfect. I, I, alas, I did not find it last night. That sucks. Sorry, man. Who did well, you go to your club with? We'll try again tonight. Um, Jut. Jut was DJ. Oh, cute. That's why I went. That's awesome. Because first of all, I would never have gone to that place. Yeah. But like, I was like, all right, I'm going to go support my friend and maybe like cherry on top. I might meet you know, someone. Yeah. Somebody, but no. Whatever. You get a good buzz? No, because we were going out tonight, oh, so I yeah. didn't want to. Yeah, I can't. Yeah. I'm 30 now. I know. Like, me too, dude. <laughs> I didn't do anything. Yet. I was going to say, you went to the club? You want to hear what me and Coda did? Because <laughs> it is boring. <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> we went to go have dinner. Mm -hmm. We had two rounds at dinner because it was still happy. <laughs> hour. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. So you had lunch is what I you're told, saying. <laughs> I told that story about San Bernardino. Now I'm saying this. You're going to think I'm whack. Then we came home. We macked. He studied. I knocked out. Well, TGIF. <laughs> TGIF. I was in bed, like, knocked out probably by, like, 10. Because <laughs> I was like, okay. oh, we can't really go out today. We're going out tomorrow. Same thing. Like, right, hey. right, right. Yeah. Plus, I want to get a good night's rest <laughs> so I could party today. Yeah, that's that was my thinking. If that's I didn't weird. go out, if we weren't going to go out tonight, then I would have probably, like, Whatever. drank and stuff. Because he, he was the DJ, so he had a table. And yeah, was, it would have been like, convenient and easy. Right. And free. And perhaps you could have found <laughs> someone convenient and easy. And also, that club is, like, for for children. It's oh, like... <laughs> it's like It's, like, 20... The, I think I would say the average age was maybe, like, 23... So like the guys are like rude, like yeah, you know, they're everybody's like, all sloppy, sloppy. Yeah. yeah, it's a shit show. People don't know how to drink. I them. saw their the, their Yelp page has a photograph of um a pool of blood. What? Like there was some sort of fight there, some real fight earlier in the month. Wow, yeah, it was bad. I did run into my friend Zara there, which was nice. Yeah, that's nice. That's good. I don't know what she was doing there, <laughs> but that was cool. <laughs> No question about it. This young lady will be grateful for such a lovely evening with a charming person like you. All right. You ready? Yeah. Okay. So what was the big news this week? It was the homecoming ceremony is what they're calling it. Okay. Of uh, Aretha Respect of, Franklin. Yeah. Of Aretha Franklin, her funeral. And it was a star-studded event. Like Everybody crazy. showed up. Everybody's yeah. there, yeah. Everybody showed up, including President Clinton gave an awesome speech. Yeah. Like it was he, they introduced him as the first black president. Like, 
that's awesome. <laughs> it was it was real cool, but the problem was that Ariana Grande performed and the the reverend who was like the MC and kind of running the show at the funeral touched her quite inappropriately. Right. So if you guys haven't seen the pictures, they were on the front page of Reddit today and it was um Basically, he was like putting his arm around her, kind of like trying to Mm -hmm. act like he's embracing her. But he's Mm -hmm. clearly like way over, way over. He's basically he's copping a feel. Yeah, he's copping a feel on her boob. Yeah, it's disgusting. Yeah. And you can and her face is like the face. We all know that face. Yeah. Like, like, is this really fucking? Yeah. Is this motherfucker for real? Right. 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 That she starts like nervously laughing. Yeah. And like probably trying to move away. Yeah. Trying to move away. And he's just pulling her in closer. And it's just. It's Imagine how many situation. times that fool has done that, like, during service then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. And he, I mean, he issued an apology. He was like, I, I hug male and female artists or people or whatever. Shut up. But you know what you're doing. Yeah. So fuck that. That was like, and th- it's so sad. It's so embarrassing for her, right? I mean, she shouldn't have to be embarrassed, but. Yeah. But it but is. It's like, embarrassing. It's, it's like, embarrassing. is this really, is yeah. this, like, you know, it's yeah, just yeah. like, fuck. Record scratch, freeze frame. <laughs> you might have uh, wondered how I got here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we got a two for this week. Oh my gosh! We <gasps> haven't told people at Saved by the Max. May and I ran into fucking two for Grace from Thirty Rock. <laughs> It was so funny. We were dying because we were like, how is this the celebrity that we're seeing right now? Yeah. And we had literally been talking about him, Twofer, Twofer yeah. that day. That's so crazy. Yeah. Oh, it was it was a great celebrity sighting. We didn't talk to him, though. No, I wanted to, but I, also he yeah. was with his wife. Yeah. yeah. He was. What a great double date he was on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we should give our, our review of Saved by the Max, oh, too. Oh, Saved by the Max was awesome. It was awesome. You guys, if you still, if you can get tickets, I think they have a lease for two years. It's so fun. It's so, like, retro, like, yeah. totally, like, deja vu reminds you of yeah, your childhood. Yeah. It's creepy. It's creepy walking into your television. Yeah, it's you know? fucking <laughs> wild. It's really, really fun. And it was super affordable, like yeah. 50 bucks each. And that mm-hmm. came with an appetizer and an entree. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it was totally worth it. Totally worth it. I mean, e- even if there, well, I was going to say even if there wasn't food. Yeah. But you feel so happy just being there. It's, yeah. It's worth You kind of forget that you're there to yeah. eat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We kept, everybody yeah. leaves their tables. So yeah. it's totally it's so fun yeah guys. it's super duper go fun. if you can yeah bring a friend uh, bring a friend send us pictures yeah we love to save by the bell yeah and we love to see pictures <laughs> well we'd better run through the whole thing again the right way because you do want to be successful with those brunettes right yeah so we're doing a two for this week <laughs> yeah <laughs> and uh who went first last time was it the chloe Sauvigny? yes so i went first yeah. right yeah okay so may may you're up batter up Okay, guys, in the first of our twofer today, I'm doing Phil Spector and the murder of Lana oh, Clarkson. I forgot about this. Is this my first murder, I think? Mm. Well, mm, yeah. N- Natalie Wood. Oh, eh, right. But low key. Yeah. Okay. Most of this research came from true crime shows that are on YouTube, Wikipedia, and I tried to find this one really great BBC doc that I saw on him like 10 years ago, but I couldn't find it. Oh, and obviously I wasn't going to pass up an opportunity to watch Dame Helen Mirren play Phil's lawyer in the HBO movie Phil Spector, Ooh. which is not, it's not super accurate. And as a movie, I'd say it's just I, like no one go out of your way to watch it. But if it's on TV, like definitely turn it on while you're like browsing Instagram or whatever. I really love HBO movies, by the way. They're so good. Shout like, out. They're, they rarely like, are bad, right? Yeah. 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 So I did learn a fun fact whoop, about this movie. Bette Midler, who I love and who, like Cher, does not act enough, uh, was supposed to play the Helen Mirren role, but several weeks into shooting, she injured her back and it had to be carried off set. Oh, shit. Yeah, it was, like, really bad. So HBO was like, fuck, we need an actress and we need her quick, and she has to be incredible because not just anyone can walk into a role with, like, no notice and in the middle of a production. Right. So they really needed someone like who could make that work and someone suggested Helen Mirren and everyone was like yes that's like, awesome whatever it takes to get her let's make it happen so Helen walked in killed it got nominated for all the awards wow and I just thought that was pretty cool because I'm a big fan of hers yeah just shows like how badass she really yeah. is she's a bad bitch I love that she's like 73 and could Fuck like steal yeah. your mans like 
<laughs> right? She's gold as fuck. I don't want your mans though, whoever. Whoever's out there listening. <laughs> Unless it's only in LA for three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> and I can get a cuddle, a sex, and a dinner out of it, baby. <laughs> okay. Philip Harvey Specter was born in the Bronx on December 26, 1939. Shout out to the Bronx. Yeah. Phil Spector and J-Lo are going on the Bronx's Mount Rushmore. <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, the fucking... Who? Uh, Jesus and Mary? Yeah, Bodega Boys. Yeah, them too. <laughs> and yes, I realize... They're in the cave. I, I, they're in the cave. They're in George Washington's nose. Yes, I realize that Phil Spector is a murderer, but still, some would say that's fitting. No shade to the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> His parents were Jewish immigrants. In 1949, when he was nine, Phil's father, Ben, committed suicide. Oh, no. Ben killed himself by carbon monoxide poisoning. Oh, shit. Which I didn't find a source said exactly how he did that, but I assume it's the leaving the car running in the right, cold the, gar- um, in the who closed did it garage. Who um, Lane. Lane. Or he tried. Yeah. Spoiler alert. Like, physiologically, I obviously I understand what happens when carbon monoxide goes into your, into your body, but... My mind almost can't compute that it's like you can freaking die by like just pulling into your garage and closing the door like right. that. It got me thinking that we're so lucky to wake up every day because you could the our world is a death trap. Yeah, like, we could yeah. fucking die at any point. OK. Four years later, in 1953, his mother moved the family to L.A. for a fresh start when Phil was 13. He went to Fairfax High and became homies with a handful of people who would later become famous musicians, including Lou Adler, who is famous for being a super producer, notably of all of the big hits from the Mamas and the Papas, and 1972's Grammy winner for Album of the Year, Carol King's Tapestry. Wow. He's also famous for owning The Roxy and being that dude that sits next to Jack Nicholson at every Laker game. (laughs) I only bring him up in this story because... I found out during research something that I didn't know about, and it's that Lou Adler had been kidnapped in Malibu in the 70s. What? Shortly after the Manson murders. Oh, shit. Everybody was, like, already freaking out. Yeah, and and they were going after musicians and musical producers. Yeah, exactly. So he and his assistant were held for a day until Lou arranged to pay a $50,000 ransom. Holy shit, that's wild. Of the two kidnappers who were later caught and charged, one is serving a life sentence, and a third has been on the run since the 70s. Oh, wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Okay, so back to Phil. He writes his first number one record at 18 with his band The Teddy Bears, a great song called To Know Him Is To Love Him, hmm. which is inspired by the epitaph on Phil's father's tombstone. No. That's crazy. Huh? Fun fact. Bloop. Carol Connors, the lead singer of the Teddy Bears, was later nominated for an Oscar for co-writing the theme from Rocky. Oh, shit. Gonna fly now. Damn. Da, 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 wow, that's iconic. Yeah. yeah. Fuck. Good for her. And she's still out there making music and singing and that's like touring badass. and stuff. She's cool. So the teddy bears sell the teddy bears. This is the dumbest name I've ever heard in my life. Seriously. Okay. The teddy bears sell a bunch of records, but basically come and go. Mm-hmm. Phil marries and divorces some poor and suspecting woman. Yada, yada, yada. Yada, yada, yada. Yada, yada, yada. And <laughs> this is usually the point in the story where someone in Phil's position goes solo and becomes a huge star. But Phil went a little different way because he suffered from pretty bad stage fright. So he decided to focus on his songwriting and producing and makes his first million dollars before the age of 21. That's badass. He quickly became a pioneer and he was known for his signature technique, the wall of sound. But he didn't have any real friends, only work friends. In fact, people that knew him would often whisper about how weird and socially awkward he was. Also, he's kind of a little guy. So he totally has this Napoleon complex. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And he starts getting super into guns. Ooh, that is not good. Yeah. In some interviews, some people who knew him said that for some reason, people always felt like they could punk him. Probably because he's like short and weird. Mm -hmm. Like they would pick on him and shit. Mm -hmm. But he would bust out a gun and be like, what now, bitch? Or whatever, you know? That or he'd send his bodyguards to rough up his bullies. Jesus Christ. So he's super fucking insecure 
Also, a lot of his immediate family had suffered from extreme mental health issues. Wow. And knowing what we know now, Phil wasn't exempt from the mental instability that plagued his family. Wow. Despite this, the hits keep on coming, and he ends up having 20 hits in three years. Jesus. Including one of my all-time favorite songs, and I would argue a damn near perfect song, Be My Baby by the Ronettes. (laughs) I was going to say, um, so I was going to try to cut you off and say, smack my bitch smack up. Smack my bitch up. <laughs> oh, and a string of hits for the Righteous Brothers, including the iconic, smack my bitch up, <laughs> <laughs> including the iconic, Unchained Melody. If you're unfamiliar with Phil Spector's music and the Wall of Sound, I'd say Be My Baby and Unchained Melody are two examples that really would give you a feel for the type of work that he was doing around that time. Yeah. And he was young. He was mm-hmm. only in his early to mid 20s. Mm-hmm. The Ronettes say that Phil was a total weirdo around this time, though. And we know, and as we know, he's painfully socially awkward. But on a trip to Europe with the Ronettes, he suddenly de- decided that he wasn't going to speak in his normal speaking voice anymore. What? <laughs> Not a la Meghan Markle. It, uh-huh. wasn't, it wasn't an accent. Yeah. From now on, he would only speak in this weird chipmunk voice what yeah how it, weird how it, weird that he's so cool and so weird at the same time well it wasn't it wasn't meant to be a joke or cute or funny or anything he's just like this is how i talk now okay you know yeah <laughs> and the press were like what yeah and the ronettes were like what the fuck but yeah. by then everyone's like well just yeah fill, well, just fill. fucking work with it he's, he's a weirdo yeah you know? whatever but he's fucking amazing at what he does yeah In 1966, when the song that he considered his magnum opus, his masterpiece, the song that was going to change contemporary music forever, River Deep Mountain High by Ike and Tina, failed to make a big enough splash, Phil decided that he'd had enough of everything and everyone. He became a recluse. I love the word recluse. Me too. And I like hearing stories of people who become recluse because it's so weird and bizarre. What was the guy uh, that Leo played? That film? Yeah. Yeah. the aviator yes god damn it but remember he becomes a recluse yeah. and like pees in jars only yeah yeah i want to um he's on our master list he is howard hughes howard hughes yeah. good job there's also another scandal that's related to him that's also on the list uh-huh where this guy faked his um his autobiography oh like it was a it, there's a oh. richard gear movie about it the hoax um, oh okay there's an there's another guy who okay i'm thinking of a more current one but the a million little pieces yes remember that book that's a, we gotta put that on the list that's a good one that's a good one that book is fucking great really i never read yes it. may i read mm-hmm. it what, it would have been good even if he would have yeah i don't know why he had to like do that but the the howard hughes thing it was it was an author who said that someone sent him a mysterious package and inside was howard hughes's autobiography oh shit and, and like we said he's a recluse so everyone's yeah. like oh fuck yeah awesome yeah and, like uh, that's hopes. awesome I'm going to become a recluse and write my autobiography. I am a recluse. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Although somehow, so he's a recluse. Although somehow he does. (laughs) Oh, that's how we got there. (laughs) He does manage to convince Ronnie Bennett, the lead singer of the Ronettes, to marry him in 1968. And she becomes Ronnie Spector. Oh, my God. (laughs) P.S. Where are Ronnie's friends? He has none, man. No, Ronnie, his wife. Like, was there no one around to say, hey, maybe don't marry a creepy, socially oh, yeah. awkward recluse? You know? <laughs> maybe don't marry that dude that starts talking to us like a chipmunk. Yes, exactly. So three years go by and he attempts a little comeback with a new single for the Ronettes, but it flops. Hmm. So he kind of moves on and produces some album called Let It Be <laughs> by some dudes named. Hold on. Let me check my notes here. The Beatles? No big deal. Just the last Beatles the album. Beatles? <laughs> the Beatles? The Beatles? The Beatles? That's the how Beatles. I always I say that when I write it out. Beatles. Yeah. Look, yeah. So, Beatles. So he produces the Beatles' last album. He goes on to produce John Lennon and George Harrison's albums featuring, you know, some songs you may have heard of, <laughs> um, My Sweet Lord and Imagine. <laughs> He once shot a gun off in the, in the studio next to John Lennon, and yep. it really pissed John off, not because someone could have gotten hurt, but because he was worried that the loud gunshot could have damaged his hearing. Oh, shit. So the Beatles, the Stones, the Beach Boys. <laughs> the Ronettes. Yeah, like fucking everybody works with this guy. Yeah. 
and he adopts three kids with Ronnie. Oh, wow. But their marriage is super fucked up and allegedly abusive. Ooh. Ronnie says that Phil kept her captive in their home. Oh, shit. Literally not allowing her to have shoes so that she couldn't walk out on him. Oh, shit. And also kept a golden coffin in their basement so that, like, he used it to constantly threaten her and say that it was meant for her so that he could display her corpse after having killed her. Yo, there is a level of fucking depth to that weird yeah. little fucking threat right there. Yeah. Like, he had to go to a coffin maker, mm-hmm. get it made out of gold, yeah. bring it to his house. What a fucking freak. Yeah. She said it had, like, a glass top, too. So he was oh, like... Oh, shit. Fucking yeah, Mary Dracula, bitch. This shit is fucking crazy. <laughs> Dracula. He wrote the Monster Mash. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite song. By that way. is your favorite song. <laughs> I instead of whatever you said over there in the beginning, be my baby. Yeah, just put in Monster, Monster Mash because you love that shit. I, I listen to that shit year round, guys. <laughs> it's always the Monster Mash <laughs> maze. It's always a graveyard smash. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, so also two of the kids claimed that they were held captive in the home when they were young. Ronnie finally managed to escape the home in 1972, literally barefoot with the help of her mom. Although the kids still had contact with Phil and they claimed that Phil Phil forced them to perform sex acts with his girlfriend. Oh my God. The youngest kid, Dante, later said, quote, for years we were just caged animals to be let out for dad's amusement. Oh my God, mate. That's fucking scary. Yeah. This guy is really seriously sick. Yeah, he's bad. Okay. Career-wise, everything was going well until 1974 when he had a really bad car accident. He was thrown through the windshield. Oh, wow. The responding officer originally thought that he was dead when he came upon the scene, but he discovered that Phil had a faint pulse, so he was rushed to UCLA Medical Center with serious injuries, which required several hours of surgery and over 700 stitches to his face and head. Oh, wow. That's fucking scary. As a result, Phil started wearing these ridiculous wigs and toupees uh-huh. pretty much for the next several decades, and he becomes a recluse again. Wow, that's fucking scary. That's my mm-hmm. worst nightmare. Oh, what, like a, a car, car accident? accident that bad. Yeah. Yeah. It could happen. Yeah, that's why it's so scary, yeah. especially where we live. Mm-hmm. He briefly did some work with Leonard Cohen and the Ramones in the late 70s allegedly forcing Dee Dee Ramone to play a particular bass line at gunpoint. Oh. But ultimately, his career declines, and he never really works again. And he full-on retreats from public life essentially forever. Yeah. And had we never heard from him again, he would have simply gone down as the most influential music producer in history. Yeah, we wouldn't know all the drama. Mm-hmm. He has a set of twins with a girlfriend in the early 1980s. Oh, wow. But one sadly dies of leukemia on Christmas Day of 1991. Oh, my God. He has a really sad life. Yeah, it's fucking crazy. But really, we don't hear much from Phil again until the night he meets a Miss Lana Clarkson. So it's February 2nd, 2003, and Phil now lives in this insane 30-room castle in Alhambra. Which, if you're not familiar with the geography of Southern California, it's a suburb of Los Angeles just east of downtown. It's A, not a place you'd expect to see a fucking castle. Yeah. And B, not a place where celebrities or industry people live. Live. But we know that Phil is a creepy recluse, so I guess it sort of makes sense that he lives somewhere slightly isolated from the industry. and Right, from everybody's uh, wandering eyes. Yeah. So that night, Phil has a date at The Grill in Beverly Hills. He goes on the date, then he drops his date off at home. We need a date, or I need, I'm sorry, I'm married. I need you to date, uh, like, an older rich guy that thinks that Beverly Hills is, like, the end-all, high-all of, like, yes class. Yes. You know? Yeah. Also, because I want, I want to be driven around to, uh, <laughs> by this dude's chauffeur, like, Fuck to yeah, Beverly you Hills. Dude. Come on. I want to, like, um, go to these old, I'll t- tell you how the date goes. Okay. okay. So he drops he drops the date off at home. Then mm-hmm. he goes to the grill for a second date. Oh, damn. <laughs> okay. With a server at the restaurant. Oh, shit. <laughs> so, like, this crazy motherfucker had two dates in one night. Right. And let me tell you, that really shook my confidence for a minute. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> you don't think you could do that? 
Well, and then, then I realized that, like, I probably could do that, but also, I don't have the patience for two men's bullshit. Yeah. You know, in one night, like, what the one fuck? is enough. Yeah. So, then Phil and his date go to Trader Vic's. Oh, wow. Which, have fucked with Trader Vic's, too. Remember on Girls Next Door? I yeah. I think it was Holly who said that was his favorite night spot. Yeah. Then they go to Dantana's. Oh, wow. So, like... This is what you're saying. Like, they're just driving around Beverly Hills. Yeah. Like, fucking, this, this would be a fun day, I think. Yeah. Like, why an not? older gentleman. Fuck yeah. Buying me, like, uh, drinks martinis. and food. And food? Yeah. yeah. Fuck yeah. yeah. It sounds amazing. You just got to, like, show a titty at the end of the night. <laughs> I'm sure that, like, the. Uh, it's probably all the waiters and maitre d's probably know who he is, too. So I'm sure, like, you walk in and they're like, Mr. Spectre. Of course. Or whatever. Yeah. They know the spiel. Yeah. So basically. This is what I wrote. I said, so basically he's hitting all the places rich old men thought were cool and would take mm-hmm. their mistresses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So shout out to mistresses. Now- <laughs> <laughs> Hell shout out to mistresses. So now it's after midnight and they go to the House of Blues where he's greeted by hostess Lana Clarkson. Lana was 40 years old and the word people kept using to describe her is statuesque because Aww. she's this tall blonde beauty. She's been in the industry since the late 1970s and had been on over 50 TV shows and had bit parts in movies like Scarface and Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Imagine surviving making a movie with the Malibu Tequila Goblin Sean Penn only to have Phil Spector fucking murder you. Jesus. Okay, so the thing with Lana was she's been in the industry for over 20 years at this point, but she never got her big break. Right. And at that point, it had become clear that it probably wasn't going to happen for her in the way that she originally wanted. Right. And she had to take the hostess job to pay her bills. Wow. Which at that time, it it wasn't the worst place to be because the area of the House of Blues where she was hostessing was only for VIPs. Right. So at least she got to interact with like really cool people. For sure. So Phil is super crossfaded at this point on alcohol and pills. Cause, yeah. And because the end of his second date. Yeah, right? right. Exactly. Lana thought he was a woman when he walked in because he's all small and he had on a ridiculous wig. Yeah. And she was like, ma'am, you can't be back here. <laughs> and then some other employees are like, no, that's Phil Spector. He's like the most VIP yeah. of all the VIPs. Yeah. So she starts tripping all over herself to try to make it right, you know? Of course. Like, so she's trying to get back on his good side and it seemingly works. Phil wants, to have, uh, wants Lana to have a drink with him. So she asked the manager if it's cool, but the manager says no. Oh, wow. By this time, date number two has already ditched Phil. Nice. And it was late. And Lana oh, sh- Sounds like date number two, by the way, is really winning in this oh, situation. Oh, God, yeah. Because they, scenario. Yeah, he was like at his peak energy during date number yeah. one. So that would have been hella annoying. Yeah, yeah. During date number two, he's already faded a little bit. Right, right. So you get to pick all the spots. He's more lenient to go to more spots and shit, spend yeah. more money on you. Yeah, exactly. And then you ditch him at the end of the night before he murders you. <laughs> right, exactly. It's a, it's a win-win. Yeah. Actually, I think uh, in one of the documentaries, they say that they ended up having that date, date number two. Like she ditched him because he wanted her to drink more, uh-huh. and she was like, "No, thanks, I'm, I'm good." Yeah, like, and he was like, "Fine, like get out of here then or whatever." Yeah. So she was like, "Fine, yeah, okay." So it was late, and Lana's shift was about to end. So then he invites her back to his castle. If someone invited me to their castle, I'd kind of be like, "Cool," but then I'd be like, "Where is it?" And he said, "Alhambra." I'd probably be like, "Oh no, mm, no, never mind, I'm good." Yeah, okay. Uh, no shade to Alhambra, but <laughs> like I'm just I don't need to go all the way out there to see a castle. Yeah. Okay. At two thirty, <laughs> they leave the House of Blues, and Phil's chauffeur Adriano de Souza drives them back to the castle, and Phil and Lana go inside. Wow. About an hour after the two went in, according to de Souza, he hears a gunshot, and Phil later comes out of the house holding a gun and said, "I think I just shot her." What? So D'Souza calls Phil's assistant, Michelle Blaine, and is like, yo, I think Phil just killed somebody. And Michelle's like, shut up. You're yeah. tripping. Because yeah. it's like the middle of the night, you yeah. know? And like, she's like, shut up. What? But D'Souza's like, no, for real. So Michelle's like, call the cops. Yeah, like, what the fuck? So he calls the cops and he tells them there's been an accident. Someone's been shot. And that his boss said, I think I shot her. Mm-hmm. So the cops show up and Phil goes, quote, come in. You're not going to believe what you see. Oh. Uh? And he starts acting all crazy, and so much so that they have to tackle him and tase him. Oh, God. Don't tase me, bruh. Yeah. Okay. So they go inside, and Lana's body is slumped in a chair. 
with a single gunshot wound in her mouth and all her teeth are all over the carpet. They recover the weapon, a Colt revolver, and nine more firearms in the house. Wow. There's a bloody cloth and hand towel on a bathroom sink. Lana's blood is on the stairway and on one of Phil's white coats found hanging in an upstairs closet and in his pocket, his pants pocket. Oh, wow. But nobody's fingerprints are found on the gun. So he cleaned the gun. Yeah. Well, he tried to clean up a lot of things because yeah. there's, you know, the bloody towels and oh, like, yeah, yeah. the staircase and like he put his coat away and like, so, but he ha- half-assed it and there was no hiding it. There's blood everywhere. Somebody shot. You yeah. Know. You fucking shot okay. someone before. What are you going to do? The police interrogate a still drunk Phil Spector and he says, quote, absolute fucking nonsense. She's a piece of shit. And I don't know what her fucking problem was, but she certainly had no right to come to my fucking castle, blow her fucking head open, and say that I murdered her. What the fuck is wrong with you people? Oh, my goodness. He said that Lana put the gun to her head and he demonstrated by putting his fingers on his temple. The death is ruled a homicide and two months later, Phil is charged with murder and pleads not guilty. He initially hires Robert Shapiro, who we know as a member of O.J. Simpson's dream team. Bail is set at $1 million, which Phil promptly pays. He and his assistant Michelle hide out at the Hotel Bel Air for a little bit. But Phil immediately wants to get his side of the story out there. So he has Michelle set up a website for him where he can post videos of himself directly discussing what he claims happened. Jesus. These videos turn out to be these crazy rants where all he can really say in his defense is that he doesn't have a motive. Which, okay. Then he claims it was an accident. Also, he's wearing a Hawaiian shirt and a puka shell ne- necklace. Probably because what he figured uh, that's what he figured an innocent person would wear or something. <laughs> so after shooting the videos of Phil, Michelle, Michelle starts to feel really uncomfortable with the unhinged explanations he was giving. Giving. And mind you, she's been with him for years and years. Yeah. Like, her dad, I think, worked with him like way back in the day. Oh, wow. So she's known him since she was a kid. Yeah. She knows him pretty well. Yeah. And I think she was like, mm-mm. Yeah. Like, this, is, this is fishy. Meanwhile, Phil is trying to get Michelle to marry him. Oh. Since she now has too much information oh. so that she can't be obligated to testify. Wow. She says, um, no thanks and yeah. quits. She claims that after she quit, he said he he should have killed her. Oh, my goodness. So finally, he goes back to his castle and ends up fucking around, firing and hiring his defense teams, which ends up delaying his trial. But the DA is eager to move forward, so they have a shot at shaking the perception that celebrities can't get convicted in L.A. Right. Tell that to Winona Ryder, though. Seriously. Robert Shapiro is replaced with Leslie Abramson known for the Menendez brothers case. But he dismisses her after they keep clashing often in front of the press because Phil is always running his mouth. Right. So instead he hires veteran attorney Bruce Cutler who defended mobster John Gotti. Oh shit. Cutler's strategy is to basically put Lana on trial, which sucks because then he pretty much victimizes the victim. Right. The defense found experts that would testify that it would have had to have been a suicide like based on all the factors yeah and then phil taunts lana in the media saying that she quote kissed the gun and committed suicide oh my god he's a monster dude what the fuck is wrong with him in 2001 so two years before lana had had an accident where she broke both of her wrists and needed surgery. Uh-huh. I don't know what kind of, maybe like skiing or something like, I don't know what kind of accident. Mm-hmm. This kept her from away from auditions for over a year. Because of this, friends say that she had been depressed and she'd also had the money problems that led to her picking up the hostess gig. Right. Her blood alcohol content that night was 0.12, so over the legal limit. And she had a little Vicodin in her system, but really like it was no, yeah, no big deal, nothing out of the ordinary. Yeah. That's that's a Friday night in L.A. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like fucking she was 40, like 40 year olds. Yeah. Love doing Vicodin and alcohol. (laughs) That shit must feel great. (laughs) Also, I guess we'd say anecdotally, but women in general don't shoot themselves in the face. Yeah, that's interesting. But it's particularly attractive women don't shoot themselves in the face that's a super rare matter of suicide for women 
Hmm. So the DA presents evidence that says that the gun was in her mouth when it was fired, but she was backing away, which they know based on the blood splatter. There was also blood splatter on the back of her wrist and his jacket, which proved that he was in front of her with his arm outstretched and that the gun was upright and pointed at her and that she couldn't have fired it. Wow. And she had her handbag on her shoulder, mm-hmm. which kind of tells us, it kind of tells us like, oh, maybe she was weaving, you know, like she wanted to leave. In the whole castle, there was only one open drawer, the one he kept that gun in. Jesus. So are we to believe that Lana randomly opened this drawer that had a gun in it and upon seeing it decided decided right then and there that she would kill herself with it? Yeah. The DA presents witnesses that tell stories of Phil pulling guns on them. Five women who are his romantic in- interests detail assaults and threats usually surrounding guns and usually after they had rebuffed his advancements. Wow. Then that's fucking scary. That's so scary. And there was drama about whether or not they could admit that. Yeah. Because what, what is the law? You're not, or at least in California, you're not allowed to like bring in. Oh, past like, behavior. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it did really prove a pattern. Of course. That, you know, he's, he, he wasn't, he was regularly going around threatening women with guns. That's probably how he got them to sleep with him. Maybe. Yeah, he looked like a fucking freak. So then the chauffeur, D'Souza, testifies that Phil said, quote, I think I killed somebody. Right. After 12 Shout days, out to that guy. Yeah, shout out to that guy. Phil tried to play it off, too. He was like, because he's um, he's Brazilian, I think. Uh-huh. D'Souza is Brazilian. He was like, oh, it was a language barrier. He didn't understand what I said. Man, nah, shut he's up. Like, he, he was like, oh, I said... Um, I think someone's been shot or something like not. I shot somebody or whatever. So after 12 days of deliberation, the jury deadlocked and a mistrial is declared. A poll of the jurors shows that 10 wanted to convict and two were stuck on not guilty. In October, 2008, the new trial begins and Phil has a new attorney, Doran Weinberg. Weinberg made him stick to one wig because for the first trial, Phil Phil came to court every day in a different outlandish wig. (laughs) Besides that, and the the wig that he settled on was like this. He had like a bowl cut. Like oh, yeah, that like yellow one? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, besides that, the defense strategy from the first trial is largely largely stays the same in the second trial. So basically muddy the waters and suggest that Lana may have killed herself. Wow. I'll jump back here to a quote from Phil made in one of those videos he had his assistant shoot and post for him on his website. Quote, I did not have anything to do with her death. She may have accidentally taken her own life. She may have purposely taken her own life. She may have been eating the gun or dancing. She may have been doing anything. I don't know why, when, how, or where, and what circumstances she may have taken her own life, whether she planned to or not. So Phil is found guilty of second-degree murder in April 2009 at age 69. He's sentenced to 19 years to life. He's currently at Corcoran State Prison, where he will most likely live out the rest of his days. For sure. He's lost his ability to speak due to benign tumor growths on and around his vocal cords. Wow. And he's, he, and he's lost most of his hearing. Lana was a very active member of her community, particularly for AIDS and HIV organizations, where she volunteered weekly since the early 1980s when people didn't even know if it was safe to be around AIDS patients. Wow. Her dream was to become a famous actress, and unfortunately, in death, she ultimately became famous. She was laid to rest at Hollywood Forever Cemetery, the final resting place of several stars, and in death, she's finally among them. Hmm. And that's the story of Phil Spector and the murder of Lana Clarkson. Wow, that's good, May. I feel so bad for her. Yeah, poor girl. She had a tough life, huh? Yeah. And she seemed to be like a nice person. You could not find a single person who would say anything remotely bad about her that's really awful it sucks that like you can be going through something in your life like it were a tough career situation like maybe you've been a little bit depressed lately and then something happens to you and like next thing you know people are slandering you in a yeah. court of law like in the media like yeah it's bullshit fucking sucks but i mean he's allowed to mount a defense and i'm glad that he's able to but that sucks yeah it does suck it sucks for her So she was 40. Fuck, she was really young. So young. Fucking crazy. Show respect for your date and her reputation, and she will respect you. 
Success with brunettes or blondes or just about anybody is built upon respect. And being a gentleman is to command respect. Should I go? No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. I'm going to tell the story of Luis C.K. Yes. Okay. This episode is going to be depressing. I know, and it's all about shitty men because yeah. we talked about the Ariana Grande guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is the, this is the feminist uh, <laughs> segment of the podcast. <laughs> okay. Louis A. Skel- Skelly? Skelly? I don't know how to pronounce his last mm-hmm. name. Better known as Louis C.K. is a writer, comedian, actor, and filmmaker. He was born in Washington, D.C. on September 12, 1967. His father is an economist who met his mother while both at Harvard. He's Mexican on his paternal side, hence the name Luis. His grandfather was a surgeon of Hungarian descent who immigrated to Mexico, where he made it, married a native Mexican woman and his dad was born in Mexico. Louis and his family moved to Mexico when he was one year old and returned to the United States after turning seven. His parents soon divorced and Louis grew up with his three sisters and single mom. He started writing during his adolescence and made some comedy shorts. He graduated high school in 1985 and began working as an auto mechanic. And he got a side gig at a public access TV cable station around the same time. He looks like a mechanic. Right? (laughs) Isn't that so weird? Yeah. Like he could totally play a mechanic. Although I've never seen a ginger mechanic. True. True. (laughs) That's the only thing that throws it off. Yeah. Uh, He first attended an open mic following high school graduation and bombed. And he said he wouldn't go back on stage for another two years. He loves to tell this story. (laughs) He kept at it and made somewhat of a name for himself. He started getting paid for opening for Seinfeld and other comedy clubs by 1989. He unsuccessfully auditioned for SNL in 1993. And he then broke through as a writer for David Letterman, Conan O'Brien, Dana Carver, Chris Rock, and other shows. So I think because he didn't make SNL, he started focusing more on writing. On writing, yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, he's not the best looking dude. Like, yeah, his stage <laughs> presence is probably not yeah, yeah. immediately uh, enticing. Yeah. Okay. But that's quite a resume, though. Right? Yeah. Okay. He, I think he really had to cement himself as a writer before he could go back up there and try mm-hmm. to get accepted yeah, by people. Yeah, know? yeah. Like Larry David. Yeah, for sure. He was married to artist Alex Bailey in 1995, and they had two daughters. In 1996, HBO released his first comedy special. He won a primetime Emmy around the same time for his work while writing on The Chris Rock Show. Wow. In the early 2000s, he basically kept doing what he was doing because his uh, writing was doing really good for him Mm -hmm. and he kept working on his stand-up, started really cementing himself in that world. He then wrote and directed the movie Pootie Tang in 2001. (laughs) That was adapted from a sketch he had written for The Chris Rock Show. Have you ever seen Pootie Tang? I have seen bits and pieces of Pootie yeah, Tang, same. but I've never like actually I've, sat down and watched it. The, I have, there's nothing that, that would ever make me want to see that movie. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, it's shocking to me that it has such this comedy pedigree, like yeah. Chris Rock show, yeah. Louis C.K. written and directed. And then it it's looks, such cheesy trash. It looks ridiculous. <laughs> it has horrible <laughs> reviews from the drama club and everywhere else. <laughs> But some people consider it a cult classic. Yeah, yeah. I've never seen it. I've like I said, bits and pieces. But like, is it what is Pootie, Han- Pootie Tang's whole deal? Is that he like he talks weird, right, or something? <laughs> like, what is the joke? I don't get it. Me either. Okay. Um, this movie cost seven million dollars to make oh, shit. and made three million dollars at the box office Ooh, okay. i'm no mathematician <laughs> but that shit don't add up <laughs> fun fact i thought it was math magician for a long time <laughs> oh my god man. <laughs> math magician <laughs> fuck yeah <laughs> Until I was like 11, I would be like, I'm no math magician, but, and no one told me anything. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Okay. So Louis had a stand-up breakthrough in 2005 when his HBO special as part of the stand-up series One Night Stand blew up. Uh-huh. Louis's comedy is observational, self-deprecating, shock humor. Yeah. He likes to talk about his marriage troubles and subsequent divorce a lot. 
his failure at getting women, masturbation and loneliness, his failures as a father, and all those other fun topics <laughs> that people like to hear about. I don't like this kind of humor. It like it's like God. I don't know. Oh, what? It's too painful. It's not. It's not painful. I'm just like, why would I want to listen to this shit? Right. It's some people call it like anti humor humor because yeah. it's not. You know. It's so weird. I do. I I was a huge Louis C.K. fan for a long time. Yeah. I mean, mostly like his. Um, not so much a stand up, although I do enjoy his stand up, but like mm -hmm. well, not anymore. But his shows, his shows and yeah. stuff. But like I do like really? I like I like the sort of painful humor. I like my humor to hurt a little. Sometimes, bit. yeah, like because I get how that like breaks attention. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's not it's not something that I want to watch like a full hour. Mm. Okay, so in two thousand six, he began writing and starring in the HBO show Lucky Louie. Mm -hmm. It was HBO's first live studio audience sitcom. It was canceled after its first season. I never watched Lucky Louie. Okay. I watched several episodes, maybe even all of it, a couple of years ago because it was on HBO Go. Mm -hmm. It is the weirdest thing because, really? like you said, it's a live studio audience. So mm -hmm. it's it's a traditional sitcom. You, you know, think, think that 70s show or yeah. like fucking like that. Friends. Yes. But there's nudity and there's cursing and oh. there's like so it's such a it's a weird yeah it's weird yeah so the tone is very strange yeah that's kind of cool okay so he released an hour long stand up special Shameless in 2007 which did really really well mm -hmm. so this is when he's blowing up yeah the next year his special Chewed Up did super crazy well and was nominated for an Emmy wow yeah his divorce was finalized in 2008. And Louis mm. famously said, well, there goes my act. <laughs> yeah. I, I hope you gave your wife a good alimony Thank after you. that. Yeah, <laughs> right? Fuck. In 2010, his concert Hilarious was taped for a special. And it was the first ever stand-up comedy film accepted into the Sundance Film Festival. Wow. Yeah. From 2009 to 2012, he played Leslie Nope's man friend on the <laughs> sitcom Parks and Rec. Yeah. They were so sweet together. They were really cute together. In 2009, FX picked up Louis's series, Louis, which he starred, wrote, directed, and edited. It features his stand-up blended with segments about his life as a divorced father. The show did tremendously well, and he was nominated for five Emmys as lead actor and won two Emmys for the episode Pregnant. <laughs> Louis is so fucking good. But mind you, I haven't tried to watch it again since, since everything. Yeah. everything. So I, pff, I'm sure there's going to be things that like make me uncomfortable now. I'm sure, yeah. But that show, like, oh. but it did have a lot of criticism, like with, uh, like what you're saying that people are like, where, where am I supposed to laugh? Like, <laughs> <what? laughs> he also won an Emmy around the time for his stand-up special, Live at the Beacon Theater. <gasps> I just remembered something. Live at the Beacon Theater is really good. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. I don't remember if that's the one. There's one that I don't like from around that era. Mm, where it's all dark, just him th yeah, on the dark yeah, stage. Yeah. yeah. Is that that one? That's like, that one, oh. yeah. There's, I think there's an episode of Louis with Chloe Sevigny. Oh, really? Where she plays someone who can't control, like who uncontrollably masturbates or something. Oh. Uh, that's creepy to like see those little yeah. hints, you yeah. know, in his shit. Live at Beacon Theater was special because it was a special, it was a successful special, and it was released under a special way. Basically, he did it all himself, wrote, edited, directed, yada yada, and instead of selling it to a producer, he distributed it digitally from his own website to the public for $5. That's so smart. It earned him over a million dollars directly. Wow. And this prompted comedians Jim Gaffigan, Joe Rogan, and Aziz Ansari to do the same thing that same year. Mm-hmm. In 2012, Louis made two other download-only specials, Word, Live at Carnegie Hall, and Oh My God. Mm -hmm. The show Louis went on for five seasons. However, the fifth season was shortened to, sorry, shortened to seven episodes rather than 13 because of the other projects he had going on mm -hmm. in 2014. Because this is now he's literally at the top of his game. Yeah. He's Sally Hawkins, Boo, and Blue Jasmine. Yeah. He was in American Hustle as an FBI agent. Mm -hmm. He was in Trumbo. He hosted SNL. Mm -hmm. He sold out Madison Square Garden eight times. Holy shit. Yeah. He was and doing everybody, movies, everything. And everybody loved, like, calling him a genius, throwing around the word genius. Yeah. And, like, so he was fucking 
killing it. it. Yeah. He had movies, stand up, his own show, a slew of guest appearances on all of his colleagues' programs because everybody liked him. After the end of the fifth season, FX announced an extended hiatus, and Louis said he wouldn't know if the show would return or not, citing to his busy schedule. He had a partnership with FX due to the success of Louis, where he would produce pilots for them. Mm hmm. So he's doing behind the scenes shit too, man. Some of his other, the other pilots, like uh, Better Things, mm -hmm. or like the show, it's a show now, but like Better Things is great. Really? Yeah. Baskets, I think, is the other one. That that's, one's, that that's one's okay. Cool. Yeah. This oh. is also the first, around the time that I heard, first heard whispers of stuff like this, of what's about to. Yeah. The bad behavior. Yeah. Ultimately, Louis did not return for. A sixth season and FX abruptly ended partnership with him following the drama I'm about to tell. In 2017, Louis directed and starred in a black and white film entitled I Love You Daddy. Mm -hmm. His daughter, played by Chloe Grace Moretz, is seduced by John Malkovich, causing drama. Mm -mm. It premiered to great reviews at the Toronto International Film Festival. On November 9th, 2017, the New York premiere of I Love You Daddy was cancelled due to, quote, unexpected circumstances. The same day, Louis' November 10th, 2017 appearance on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert was also abruptly canceled by his team. Mm -hmm. Hours later, the New York Times published a story revealing sexual harassment allegations by five women made against Louis C.K. In the piece, written by Melina Rizik, Kara Buckley, and Jody Cantor, Okay, so, so four of the women use their names, so I'm going to use their names. Mm -hmm. And then the last woman stays anonymous, so okay. obviously I'll stay anonymous. The first two women, Dana Goodman and Julia Wolof, performed with Louis at the U.S. Comedy Arts Festival in Colorado. Mm -hmm. After the show, it was like well over 2.30 and all the ball bars were closed, so Louis invited them to host his hotel room to have a drink. Yeah. They didn't think anything of it immediately. Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like, they were that, like, That's yeah. your coworker. Yeah. You've been yeah. like, yeah. Somebody who's really big in this yeah, industry, yeah. you yeah. know? After arriving in his room, he asked if he could take out his penis. <gasps> they laughed at what they thought was a joke, and then he really did it. He took it oh, out. No. He took it out? He took <laughs> it out. <laughs> oh, my God. You, I totally could imagine, like, you laugh. You laugh. You think. I would like, absolutely laugh. That's what Howell said, too. He was like, I, if anybody like did that, I would totally think it's a joke. Right. Yeah. Or said it. He said it. Yeah. He, he said it. And then if he did it, I'd be like, what the yeah. fuck? And like, creepy as fuck. Yeah. After he took it out, he took off mm -hmm. the rest of his clothes and masturbated naked in front of them. What the? He, there's something wrong with you. That's fucking right? scary. Yeah. Fuck. He ejaculated onto his own stomach and then confusingly asked, which one's which again? Wh who's? What the? Yeah. Don't masturbate in front of someone you don't, no. you can't tell the difference. Yes. Between. <laughs> if you can't tell the difference between two people you're about to masturbate in front of, maybe don't do, don't it. do it. Maybe don't do, do it. it. Dana and Julia told other people about the incident in the hotel room and his manager was very upset at them because they talked about it so openly. Yeah. And the manager like had words with them. What's his name? Dave something? Um, Dave. Yeah. Dave something. Mm -hmm. They hadn't asked people for advice because... I'm sorry. They asked a lot of people for advice because they were fucking freaked out and they didn't know if they could press charges. Like they didn't know yeah. what had happened to yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were like, "Can is this rape?" It's, like, yeah, you know, right, like they're right. so they don't fucking know. That's so fucked up for someone to put you in like that horrible position where you start questioning your own victimhood. Like, yeah. am I a victim? Did yeah. this happen? Did it, first of all, did it really happen? Second, Second of, of all, all like, was it okay? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. They were scared of what would happen to them and their careers if they kept oh, talking about God it. So. It. And his manager at this time told them, stop fucking talking about it. Yeah. Then afterwards, they say that they were immediately known for talking, being the girls that talked about this incident. Oh, God. Which should be a good thing. But no, like the comedy yeah. scene would like, like be like, oh, those are those girls that mm -hmm. wouldn't shut up about Louis. Mm -hmm. You know, how could they tarnish his name? Yeah. Rather than him tarnishing himself for being fucking disgusting. Mm -hmm. In 2004, a woman named Abby called Louis to invite him to a show she had written. She was dating a writer who worked with Louis. Mm -hmm. So she was like, oh, I should invite Louis, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Louis quickly advised over the telephone that he had he seen pictures of her and began to say inappropriate things to her. 
and then began to breathe heavily, talk softly, and tell her his fantasies. Oh, no. So she realized that he was masturbating. Oh, no. In 2005. Wait, you know there's a scene like that in uh, one of his shows? In uh, the movie in I Love You, Daddy. Is that what it's called? Um, in I Love You, Daddy, there's the character that he plays is somebody who's like uncontrollably masturbates. Yeah, and there's a scene where, like, someone mimes masturbation while they're on the phone. Uh, really? Yeah. It's disgusting. In 2005, Rebecca Corey said that while she appeared with Louis for a TV pilot, so they were both going to be on this pilot. Mm-hmm. And then when they're on set, like, after, like, scenes cut or mm-hmm. something, mm-hmm. that he leaned into her ear and asked if he could go to her dressing room later to masturbate in front of her. Mm. She declined and reminded him that he had a daughter and a pregnant wife at the time, to which he responded that she had issues. Oh, oh, okay. Uh Uh-huh. Wow. Yeah. You're a prince. Rebecca Corey's story is particularly sad because she was a longtime comedian, writer, and actress at the time, Mm -hmm. and she spoke out immediately following the event, and executive producers of the pilot, Mm -hmm. Courtney Cox and David Arquette, confirmed the incident to the New York Times. Wow. Courtney and David said that, yes, she told them about it like immediately Uh after and they were both ready to stop production. Mm -hmm. But Rebecca requested that they just move on with it because it was kind of like the break she had been working for. So fucking sad. Isn't that fucking horrible? Yeah. And she didn't want everybody else to lose their jobs, too, because then everybody was going to lose their jobs. That's true. Oh, God. Isn't that a horrible place to be in? All of that on your shoulders? Yeah. That's horrible. It's so fucking disgusting. Shout out to uh, Courtney and David for trying to do the right thing. Right? Like, they were like, no, fuck this. This is not okay. The fifth woman. Also, I will say that they are two of the people that maybe aren't considered in the comedy world. Mm. I think the comedy world really protects this motherfucker. Yeah, they do. And we'll get to that. Yeah. But David and Courtney, like, they're like, fuck no, this is not going to happen. They don't have a... Um, camaraderie or whatever well they don't have a the what is what is that thing is it dog in the fight yeah exactly yeah Yeah. the fifth woman in the story requested anonymity she said that while she was working in production at the chris rock show in the late 90s louis would often and repeatedly ask her to watch him masturbate while they were in his office at the time she was in her early 20s and said that she would let him do it because she felt like she couldn't say no to him but she knew that it was wrong Wow. A coworker confirmed that the woman had confiding had confided in him long year long time ago regarding the experience when it was going on. Does he I mean he has two kids, but does he have sex with women? I don't know. That's what I think. Like I think Is either he, like maybe he can't or Yeah. Like can't as in like maybe mm-hmm. he can't do it, like perform or whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. or can't like he doesn't get girls. But I imagine he would get girls. I, yeah, I think he would get girls. I'm just wondering if if his thing is only masturbation. Like, yeah, if like that's if what gets him off. If you're Louis's girlfriend or his wife or something. Yeah, like, like you have to sit there and watch him. Yeah, is that? Yeah, maybe not. Like in uh, what was that show? With what? um the girl from Arrested Development, Search Party. Yeah. Remember her boyfriend weirdly. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. That's they're having sex. Is mm-hmm. is him masturbating while she watches? Yeah. It's so weird. That's a good ass show. <laughs> yeah, shout out, shout out to Search Party. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the that's the basically cliff notes of the article that came out that dropped, and Louis was obviously immediately asked to comment on the accusations by the piece in the New York Times, to which his publicist Louis K initially said he would not be answering any questions. Mm-hmm. It seemed like a lot of people knew about Louis's behavior and went out of their way to defend him and protect his reputation. The woman, Rebecca Corey, and the first two girls, they, oh, well, no, no, no. The woman, Rebecca Corey, has a really sad essay in Vulture about how when she spoke out against Louis, it kind of blacklisted her. And before she decided to speak, everyone was trying to get people to shut up at scene parties and comedy clubs and shit. Yeah. Like, people would be like, don't fucking talk about that. Right. Yeah, like, you don't bring that up. And I'm sure some of those people, at least some of them, probably thought they were doing her a favor. Yeah. Like, yeah. don't talk about that because yeah, like, it's going to be shut like, up. Yeah. yeah. But, god damn it. Isn't that so disgusting? Like, this little hierarchy of... This is why I'm mad at people who are like, has the Me Too movement gone too far or whatever? Like, like, go fuck yourself. Yeah. Like, enti- like every fucking success story and I don't know, whatever, anyways. 
In 2015, the website Defamer circulated rumors of Louis' alleged misconduct. Rebecca then received a call from Louis with an apology. She says he started by saying, sorry for shoving you in the bathroom. And she had to point out, uh, that wasn't me. Ugh, so there's more. There's yeah, countless. Yeah, there's more. Yeah. She said this was particularly startling, obviously, because there were other moments of misconduct. Around the same time, he messaged that girl, Abby, the, the phone girl, uh, yeah. on Facebook and apologized to her. And okay. he, he complimented her show. The day after the New York Times article was published, Louis issued a statement. He said that the stories were true. He thought it was okay because he never showed anyone his dick without first asking. But he didn't realize the power he had over them and that his question wasn't really a question. Mm -hmm. He recognized that he used the power irresponsibly. He tried to learn and run away from this. He's aware of the extent of the impact of his actions. He took advantage of the fact that he was admired in their community and this disabled them from sharing their story and brought them hardship. He didn't realize he was doing that. He didn't have to think about any of that. He ends with saying, quote, the hardest regret to live with is what you've done to hurt someone else. And I can hardly wrap my head around the scope of hurt I brought on them. I'd be remiss to exclude the hurt that I've brought on people who I work with and have worked with whose professional and personal lives have been impacted by all of this, including projects currently in production, the cast and crew of Better Things, Baskets, The Cops, One Mississippi, and I Love You, Daddy. I deeply regret that this has brought negative attention to my manager, Dave Becky, mm, Dave who Becky. only tried to mediate a situation that I caused. I brought anguish and hardship to the people at FX who have given me so much the orchard who took a chance on my movie. Sorry. And every other entity that has bet on me through the years. I've brought pain to my family, my friends, my children, and their mother. Could you imagine his ex-wife? Yeah. Because... The- not only do you find out like this was going on while I was pregnant and while like, I was with yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah. And then what do you tell your kids? Yeah. What do you tell your two fucking daughters? Yeah. To top it off. God damn it. He's then he says, I've spent my long and lucky career talking and saying anything I want. I will now step back and take a long time to listen. Thank you for reading. Following the ordeal, his manager, David Becky, dropped him as a client. OK, mm, you already yeah. did all the dirty work. Yeah. One year prior, comedian Roseanne Barr had described hearing stories of Louis locking the door and masturbating in front of women. Mm -hmm. That's so weird. Yeah. Jen Kirkman, too. Yeah. Are you going to talk about that? No. Jen Kirkman, he he had said something creepy to her Mm -hmm. and she had heard um, rumors about the masturbation thing Mm -hmm. and she talked about it on her podcast and immediately like got blackballed by everybody she didn't even say his name she was just like there's a certain comedian that like oh she was just like i just want girls to be careful yeah around him and like she got blackballed what the it was like really bad yeah his colleague tig notaro said she had to distance herself from louis after he refused to address the sexual misconduct allegation Mm mm-hmm the film I Love You, Daddy was canceled for distribution and co-stars Chloe Grace Moretz and Charlie Day refused all promotion of the film. FX, like I said, cut all ties with Louis and Netflix announced that his second special for the network would not be moving forward. Mm. HBO immediately dropped all of Louis's content from their on-demand services and mm. took him out of a lineup for an upcoming autism awareness TV special. Mm-hmm. TBS suspended and scrapped production of an animated series, The Cops, in which he voiced a main character. And then his character in the Secret Life of Pets franchise was replaced with Patton Oswalt. Wait, what? Yeah. They they took his voice out? No, they just like for the rest of the because there's like Secret Life of Pets one through like oh, three. Oh, okay. So Louis had been in the first one, so they yeah, were like yeah. they were just replaced him with Patton Ald- oh, Oswalt for the next two. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Following the fall from Grace, Louis snuck off, probably on his boat, <laughs> probably to masturbate without an audience. Mm-hmm. Louis had avoided questions regarding his political views uh, by saying some things are conservative and some things are liberal. However, he said he wanted a conservative president but would not support Donald Trump and compared him to Hitler. So that's kind of interesting to me. I guess he's a Republican, Mm -hmm. right? This Sunday, August 26, 2018, Louis made an unannounced appearance at the Comedy Cellar in New York where he performed a 15-minute set. We are now nine Mm. months after his sexual misconduct came to light. Not after any of these instances, but after it all came to light. Mm -hmm. He had tried to get a spot on an open mic in D.C. at a comedy club called Summers, but they would not respond to him. Mm -hmm. 
The owner of the New York Comedy Club said Louis showed up unannounced and asked the MC for a spot. He shot down the rumors that Louis paid to get on stage. He also said only one person has complained regarding Louis's performance. Aziz Ansari also performed five times at the same club since his sexual misconduct came to light. Most industry people predicted that Louis C.K. would inevitably try to push his way back in through stand-up at clubs. His set included over-tipping waitresses, racism, and parades. Mm -hmm. So this was everywhere this week, and this is like the where we're going to lead off, right? That's, yeah. Because, so this week, a bunch of comedians came to his fucking defense that he came back. Yeah. Michael Che, right? Che. Che from SNL. Mm -hmm. Michael Ian Black. Mm Mm-hmm. Anybody else? Yeah. It's just, it's it's kind of fucked up. Like, Aziz, the Aziz thing, like, okay, he needs to, th- there needs to be a way to kind of, like, ease Aziz back into. Right, because what he did isn't for unforgivable. Right. It seems right. like he, it was, kind, maybe, that is more believable as, like, an accident, like, mis- yeah. misreading. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the vibe than like this is i think aziz like he recognizes that what he did was like fucked up it's a part of rape culture and i think and i hope that he recognizes that in himself and he's like all right how do i fix this and how right. do I move forward right but like the louis thing no like, the louis thing is fucking gross mm-mm. the louis thing is like he has like a pattern of predatory behavior yeah and like the, he's a predator he's a predator and not only that but he purposely a, like aided in ruining women's lives livelihoods and careers yeah over this over to protect this. himself to, yeah and to yeah. like kind of like keep this going for himself right so you can't ruin someone's whole life and then be like well nah. I've, done, I've done enough yeah it's been nine you months know, it's been nine months so um yeah. i follow a lot of crisis managers on facebook yeah. people that's actually like a lawyer job that you can oh, do. Really? yeah so like these two attorneys i follow do crisis management and they um one of them post like people were asking them, what are your thoughts? What are your mm-hmm. thoughts? And one of them said, um, you know, this is like a newer type of crisis that mm-hmm. we see people go through. And we haven't really seen how long it should take for them to come back. But uh, I will say that Betty Ford spent longer in rehab. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah like yeah. what it like nine months is enough for you to like maybe apologize and right. like maybe start that discussion yeah yeah but nine months is not enough for you to like get the help you fucking need to right. stop this shit of course and the thing is i like his apology yeah like i don't know if he if that's enough for the women that he hurt and i no, actually i do know it's not enough yeah, for the women that, that he hurt but like it's very like, matter of fact yes but I think that he said, okay, I did it. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Also, like, like, do you think he knew exactly what to say because he's been waiting for this shit? Like, yeah. He's been yep. thinking of- he's, had, he's had years yeah. to In 2015, this. when the one uh, website posted the shit, like, of the rumors, he probably had a statement ready. Yeah. Like, yeah. He probably sure. thought, like, this shit is coming. Uh, who said something? Someone said something. Oh, that the Dixie Chicks said they didn't like president bush one time and, and that blacklisted them for, for way longer for a decade yeah <laughs> this yeah. motherfucker nine months later i yeah. remember madison the third said something real funny he was like <laughs> louis ck this happened in when did this come out november of uh, this last year last year november yeah. of last year he was like i'm still waiting for a text back from a guy from november of last year <laughs> um <laughs> Also, my thing, another thing that I wanted to say is, like, why do they have to defend him so bad? Like, you can't let someone new in or what? Right, right. Why do we need Louis? Like, I mean, we had Louis and it was great. And, like, unfortunately, we can't have him anymore. So, like, let some new, unproblematic, fresh face come into the comedy world. Like, why the fuck not? You think he's going to be the only successful comedian or what? Yeah. You think he's Mm -hmm. one of a kind? No. Mm -hmm. We don't need him. There's, like, ten other guys waiting. Or women. Or women, yeah. (laughs) It's like, fuck. I also don't like, uh, oh, here's a tweet I saw this week that I thought was really good. Um, Ali Siegel, who I will mm-hmm. say is one of my favorite people on Twitter, that's Jason Siegel's little sister. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she said, the Louis C.K. thing, Louis C. K. thing seems simple. In what other profession can you mm-hmm. jerk off on your coworker and then return to your place of employment? Yeah. Famous people don't get a free pass. If you're a man defending him, question why? And I think it's yeah. true. Like, what other job yeah. could you possibly go back to? Right. No. 
Dana Schwartz, who's a writer that I follow on Twitter, said something interesting too. She said that if he were the manager at a Dairy Queen, yeah, and jacked off in front of his employees, and then like came back to work nine months later, like, "Hey guys, ready to do my yeah," <laughs> like, and the D- Dairy Queen would like be like, "Hell no!" No, Dairy Queen would flip their shit. <laughs> but the comedy world out here embracing this motherfucker, uh, yeah, yeah, it's do better. It's a, Come on, guys, it's because it's a men's club, and at the end of the day, yeah. men are gonna protect yeah. other men. Yeah, it's bullshit. Also, because you know. A lot of these men look at like a a, a quote unquote good guy like Aziz Ansari. Yeah, like they they all are starting to recognize things in themselves that are mis- making them question like, oh maybe I shouldn't have done that. Right. Maybe I, like so it if they can rehab like the worst of them, they're like okay, well then I can kind of like yeah, know. like settle down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's mm. the story of Louis C.K. and his comeback this week. Oh God, fucking crazy, right? Oh yeah, that's. That I hate that story because I used to like him I know, so much it's so and like scary. and he's Mexican. Yes, I used to. <laughs> I was gonna write this. Like I used to be so proud to be like, did you know yeah, Lucy Cage yeah, Mexican? Yeah. Now I don't bring that shit up. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking white dude. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking white people. Am I right? Ah. <laughs> <sighs> oh. Well, guys, that was our depressing episode this week. Re- yeah, I don't know. Let's not do one like that again for a while. Yeah, let's do something silly. Well, yeah, let's do something silly. <laughs> <laughs> no more murders. He took it, it out. He <laughs> took it out. <laughs> Doesn't she do like... Yeah, yeah. He took <laughs> it out. All right, guys, hit us on the hotline at 505-530-9556. Hit us up on instant Twitter at Drama Club Pod. Uh, buy a fucking sticker. Buy a sticker. We're about to write some notes to all of our fans who bought stickers for us. Thank you, you guys. And if you guys purchase a sticker via PayPal, you will also get a handwritten note from me and I. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. A dare I say love letter. A love letter. We are very romantic. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's it. <laughs> that got weird. <laughs> All right, bye guys. Bye. However, whatever with your helmet.